everybody for being here with us and choosing our um, group. Hopefully we won't regret it. Um, I'm also going to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alberto Picholi and I work with IOM in Northeast Nigeria as site planner. Um, I'll introduce the rest of the speakers and facilitators um, in a minute. Um, what I would like to apologize, um, as you can imagine, uh, since I'm in Maiduguri, my connectivity might not be as beautiful and perfect as those facilitators sitting in Europe <laughs> in their comfy houses. So apologies for that. Um, in any case, we have a backup plan if something happens. Um, again, at the beginning, uh, actually, Jessica, if you could go to the next slide, what I'm going to do is just give an overview of the session. Um, so thanks again for joining. What I would like to do straight away, since we have um, around 20 people now, uh, is just to understand uh, with a quick poll kind of the diversity of the group. Um, and we're going to do that in a second. Uh, then I'm going to go through the context very quickly and maybe show some of the camps that uh, and camp-like settings here in Northeast Nigeria to give a taste for those of you who are not familiar. Um, we're going to talk a bit about how the response evolved over time in the past years. Um, then we're going to have a quick break, see if you're still with us. Um, maybe um, address any question that might have come up. Um, and, and then we're actually going to go into the meeting which is presenting some different approaches to tackle congestion in camps, uh, different speakers for that. And then we'll hopefully have some time at the end for some Q&A discussion. However, before we start, if you do have a question, um, you can just raise it through um, the uh, chat function and we'll try to address it either um, as we go along in text or we will do it in, um, in the time that we allocated for that. Um, so um, I think we can start. Next slide, please. I hope you can all hear me okay. So something I want to start with is there's a little yes or no button that you should already be familiar with at the bottom of um, the chat or at the bottom of the participant uh, group. Um, and the first question that I would like all of you to answer is if you are familiar with the context of Northeast Nigeria. This is just and who's in the room and how much time should we actually spend to talk about it. So I'm gonna start and I'm, click, I'm gonna click yes. So please uh, do the same, yes or no. Um, currently, I can't see the answers. So if anyone can, then just let me know. I cannot either. Maybe Laura, you can give us a summary if you can see them. I can only see Alberta so far. I don't know if that means no one else has clicked or I can't see them. Oh yeah, there's two people saying yes. There's That's no a test to see who's, go who's actually awake <laughs> and who is following us. Um, anyway, so since you're busy uh, clicking yes or no, I'll introduce the rest of the speakers today. We have um, Jessica Mamo, um, who's project officer in IAM Geneva, but was formerly in my same role as site planner here and will help me throughout the session. Uh, Maji Muhammad is Community Engagement Officer in Bantu, South Sudan with IOM and was formerly also in uh, IOM Nigeria in the CCCM team. Uh, Gideon Ngara joins us also from the CCCM team in Maidugu as project assistant. And then last but not least, we also have Rob Roberto Diambo, who is the sector coordinator for the Shelter and FI and CCCM joint sector here in Maiduguri. Um, now we have a very diverse um, panel or rather it's not a panel, we're gonna be speaking to you and showing some examples. Uh, but we also want to find out um, from you if you have worked on campus congestion. So that's the second question. Maybe Laura, could you give us a summary of who was familiar with Northeast Nigeria's context to now? Yeah, so for the familiarity, we got five people saying yes and two people saying no. So a lot of okay. people not responding, which might mean they're somewhere in the middle. All right, so either sleepy or or not aware. Um, so that's good. So maybe next question um, is if you have worked on camp decongestion before um, in humanitarian settings or elsewhere, um, please again just type yes or no, um, or rather click on yes or no if you have or if you have not. Um, the reason why we're doing this is just because so that we have a feeling of who's in the room. Um, 
obviously those of us who are speaking to you have some sort of experience and should know something about the context because we've worked here but uh, because we have prepared some brief introduction on the context but we don't want to spend too much time on that if um, you guys are mostly familiar with it already so we've got about even we've got four people saying that yes they have worked on company congestion before and oh no five sorry five saying yes and four saying no all right so it's kind of 50 50 for those that answered um finally if you can and you probably some of you already started uh to write uh, the country where you're working at the moment or you've worked before and you think it's relevant for the congestion uh, so that we have an idea of a geographic diversity of the group um and probably of you have experience in the congestion we actually want to hear from you um, during the session so I think you can start and thanks so much for participating as you write your countries we will move on um, so I'm going to be uh, starting with a very very brief overview of the context again not to spend too too long on this um, context overview I don't want to spend too much time just the, the thing I want to you to take away from this slide is that we still have over 2 million people displaced in Northeast Nigeria and it's been already more than 10 years since the crisis started and particularly when you look at the displacement um, uh, distribution, uh, Borno stated that this proportion that has more uh, IDPs and also interestingly um, has a distribution between IDPs living in camps or camps like settings as opposed to uh, host community settings that is fairly high compared to the other states. So we're going to look at Borno State particularly in this session because we're tackling the congestion um, as a subject. Next slide. Something that I would like to also highlight in the context, I'm not going to go through the details, but you can, we can come back if you're interested, um, is uh, the security and access challenges in a very volatile environment. The picture that you see in this slide is trying to show you an example of a town where you have, which is the majority of towns here in, in Northeast Nigeria that have a security perimeter. And this is normally either a line of um, security outposts, military outposts, and or um, an actual trench, physical trench. And this obviously has a big impact on the land availability, but also on the access to these uh, I would call them satellite towns or garrison towns that are protected, but everything else outside is um, no man's land in a way. Um, next. Some of the key challenges security have mentioned. Um, in camps, we have challenges with fire, obviously, because of a number of reasons. We also have extreme weather conditions, both in the dry season, um, really arid climate. We're almost at the border with the Sahel, but also um, on the opposite side of the spectrum during the wet season where we have extreme weather um, like storms and heavy uh, downpours that often lead to localized flooding. Um, and last but not least, a very big challenge that we have and more and more as we move on uh, into the response is scarcity of land availability. Um, so next slide, please. Um, again, as a just a taste of since we're talking about camp decongestion, I wanted to give an overview of some of the camps that we have here. And we somewhat arbitrarily uh, came up with these variables or categories to um, kind of distinguish between different types of camps. Is the site planned? What type of um, shelter is there predominantly? Does it have a clear boundary? Is it congested or not? Who owns the land? Um, where is it located? And what about security wise? Next slide, please. So I'm just going to give some examples. Um, this is an example of a very, very large camp um, that sits at the fringes of town, has a clear wall that demarcates it, is on a public land, and it's mainly planned, as you can see, but also has only emergency shelters built by agencies. Next one. Um, this example, on, on the other hand, is a very different type of camp. It's in a different town. Uh, it's relatively small scale. It's not very clear where the boundary ends and where uh, the host community begins. It's also quite congested, especially at the localized level. And all the shelters are not being built by agencies. They're being built by IDP spontaneously. So it's a makeshift type of um, shelter. 
And also, interestingly, there's a mixed uh, land ownership. Some, some plots are private, some plots are public. Next slide. Um, again, example from Pulka. Here, most of the sites um, looks, look almost the same. It's planned sites, uh, only emergency shelters as well. Um, and something to raise here is that apart from the fact that everything is on private land, so this can cause some issues, um, also, they're all, all the camps are at the fringes of town, they're permeable, there's no clear boundary, and so they're also more exposed to possible infiltrations or, or attacks from non-state armed groups. Uh, next slide. This example is from uh, another location in Gala, and it shows a camp that is really, really congested, um, completely unplanned. It's on public land, so that's a plus in a way, uh, but has a very clear boundary and it doesn't really have any possibility for expansion. Uh, and it has uh, one of the big issues with this, with this camp is uh, seasonal flooding. Next. Um, last but not least, and we'll look a bit more about this later, uh, an example from Mairuguri actually, um, uh, which is the capital of Borno State, so where most organizations are based and the government uh, as well. Um, is an example of a camp where you have a mixed situation in terms of shelter conditions. Some IDPs are actually living in pre-existing buildings. Uh, some IDPs are living in uh, shelters that have been built by agency. Um, and, and the congestion level is relatively high, at least in certain locations. Um, but this is actually is a good example of many camps that have been uh, built in Maiduguri at the beginning of the response and still exist to date. I'm actually handing over to Jessica now. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm just going to take you very quickly through the, the evolution of the response. Um, it's changed quite a bit over the years. Um, since uh, the, the, the states um, in the Northeast were accessible by humanitarian partners in 2015, 2016, um, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot has changed, um, both in the context as well as our own response. Um, so when 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 access first opened up in 2016 um uh, we we saw that the military was reca recapturing the headquarter towns and the local government areas um across the states um so they were newly accessible um, and they were continuously on the increase and the government was pushing a lot um for these towns to to be opened and to come back to life um so there was a focus on rehabilitation of the infrastructure and so on so um at this time, the issues with land availability was was not not too much. The majority of camps were being set up within heavily damaged uh, government infrastructure, like schools and um, and hospitals, uh, like such as the ones that were already presented in the examples. Um, so the humanitarian response moved a lot first from uh, providing shelter solutions to families who were already displaced, um, who, who were who we were now seeing in the new accessible areas. Um, and then later in 2017, there was also another push from the government to move the people out of the hospitals, for example, um, and set up new camps um, so that the government can rehabilitate the hospitals and people can return back to the, to the towns. Uh, so this is the kind of uh, between 2016 and 2017. When you start looking at 2018, there were no new areas that were recaptured by the military. So the, the land, the area, the protected areas became quite static, relatively. Um, the government was focusing on, on reinforcing those towns and, and started discussions around setting up super camps, so having one whole town um, being heavily protected, but then outside of those boundaries was a, was a free-for-all, basically, unprotected. Um, uh, and then also starting to encourage the, the return of IDPs um, to their communities of origin, but not not hindering the, the setup of camps um, to such an extent. Um, land availability was, we, we were still setting up new camps, so there still was some sites, there was still land available, but um, the fact that there were quite fixed perimeters, like the trenches we mentioned already, as well as the limited capacity of the military to, to protect um, uh, new sites um, and expand the sites, this this limited the the availability of land um, but as i mentioned we were still setting up new camps and we had now but started seeing a strong shift um, towards advocacy for new land um, at the both 
with the state and the federal level, so through, through the UN humanitarian teams, etc. Um, and now moving more into 2020, um, this year the access has not improved. It has actually in some cases um, reduced due to the security risks. Um, from the government side, there's a big focus on returns and recovery and more of a push to actually close camps and not um, set up new camps. Um, available land is, is close, to, close to nothing and there have only been minor camp um, expansions um, throughout the last few months. So we've seen a very big shift in the type of response um, uh, that, that humanitarian partners can actually um, carry out, um, but as you can see at the bottom of the at the bottom of the slide, the number of IDPs that are displaced is still on the rise, a slow rise, but still on the rise. Um, so this was quite an interesting um, observation. We want to see if you're still awake, <laughs> um, and we thought we'd just ask you very quickly, and maybe you can just write them in the chat. Like we can start a discussion in the chat, um, or if you want to discuss openly, you can raise your hand. Um, can you think of other challenges in this response uh, where you work or in general related to congestion in camps? Um, and if you have any questions on the context so far. I'll open the floor. Maybe um, here I was looking at the countries where people are from as people start formulating their questions. Um, I can see uh, some people from East Africa, um, Somalia, uh, South Sudan, Sudan, Kenya. Um, obviously, some people have experience in Nigeria and West Africa. And then I see someone from Bangladesh, I think it's Clementine, I'm not sure. Um, and anything, I, I, I would say that some of the challenges, I've, I've been to um, Somalia, for example, and I've uh, also uh, followed a lot the response in South Sudan. There are some similarities there, although obviously each context is unique. Uh, on the other hand, on the other hand, I think Bangladesh is a very, very peculiar context that it differs quite a lot from from the conditions we see here. Um, some of the challenges are the same, like congestion is is true everywhere probably, um, but the other variables could be um, interesting to explore. So if anyone wants to contribute from the different contexts where they've worked or they're familiar with, uh, let us know now, uh, or just uh, think about it and write it in the chat at any point as we move along with the presentations. We'll have another chance to discuss as well at the end of the presentation. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead. <laughs> I'm not seeing any hands raised, so I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, we're gonna start talking about the different approaches that we've um, we've uh, taken. Um, as Alberto was mentioning before, the contexts and the camps vary so much um, across, across the state, um, be it whether land is available or not, if there's a fixed perimeter or not, the, 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 the willingness and capacity of, of the security forces. Um, this has led us to, to need to take very different approach, uh, approaches in different areas. So we'll have a speaker for each um, different location and different, different approach that was taken. Um, I'll start first um, presenting the case of Pulka um, on land advocacy. So Pulka is located in the local government area of Boza here. Uh, it's about the uh, southeast of, of Maya de Guri. Um, so in Pulka there are five camps and one ever-growing uh, reception center. So if you look at the pictures, the top photo um, is the transit site as it stood in 2017, which were just a couple of um, like eight or 10 transit shades, open transit shades, not partition, which were set up in an emergency context. Um, when there was a new influx, they just literally needed to set up shelter for people to sleep under in the rainy season. Um, two, two years later in 2019, we had uh, we set up a full blown reception center added on more transit shades, um, built communal partition shelters. And this, this reception center is always, always full um, of new arrivals. No matter how many shelters are built, um, it's just, it's, it's, uh, it, the, the, the situation never seems to improve much because the new arrivals are, are continuously, continuously um, experienced in, in Polka, particularly. Um, 
So they're, the first camps were set up in, at the end of uh, 2016 and early 2017, and th these two camps are still existing. Um, they have about 9,000 individuals living there currently. Um, and since, since then, it has just been a constant effort to, to identify new areas where shelters can be constructed. Um, also, as I mentioned, expanding the reception center um, until individual shelters that can be constructed and trying to find um, new solutions of how to deal with the, the congestion. Um, so I'm going to just show you the evolution of the, of the town. So this is Pulka. Um, yeah, so this is the map of Pulka. You have, you have a very heavy, dense uh, host community in the center. In the south, this is uh, the start of the mountain range, um, which is actually a Boko Haram <laughs> area. Um, so this was at the end, in December 2016, there was just Camp A that was set up for 500 uh, shelters. Um, there were about 15,000 people living in the host community at the time. Um, but soon after the military had recaptured the town, then humanitarian partners um, moved in and started setting up the camp. So this is December 2016. Um, looking one year later, there were three camps, a total of about 1,500 shelters that had been set up, Camp A, B, and C. Very uh, <laughs> good, good names, though. <laughs> um, but so within a year, we had already reached the maximum capacity um, of the town within the, within the security perimeter. Now, what was interesting about um, this town in particular is that there wasn't a fixed a trench around the town. It was just uh, military outposts, as Albert had mentioned. I'll put a photo of it in the lower left corner. So they're semi-temporary structures that were set every approximately 200 meters around the town. Um, but there was no physical trench that was dug at this stage. Um, so we were already working with the commanding officer of the town and they were, they were very much aware of the, the situation, particularly in the reception center and the, tra and the transit shades at the time. Um, uh, so so we, we worked closely with them and we encouraged them and we advocated for, for additional land um, to, be, to be provided through the expansion of the perimeter. So as you can see here, there's a light gray line. That is the, the new, uh, the new uh, perimeter that was, that was uh, later set up. So this is December 2017. Moving six months later to June 2018, um, we set up another camp, Camp D, and we, had ex we expanded Camp C. Um, uh, the military, the security perimeter had already been completed and already we are once again reaching the, the limit of uh, viable land that can be used for shelter construction at this stage. So within six months, um, it was already getting quite bad. And, we, and during this time is when the reception center was set up, um, expanded. Um, going six months later, so December 2018, we set up the last camp, Camp E. Um, we expanded Camp D, but other than that, we couldn't, there was no uh, new land within the town um, limits that we, could, that we could consider for construction. Um, so once again, uh, continuous advocacy with the, with the community, with the commanding officer of the town. Um, we identified land here in the southeast corner of, of, of Pulka. Uh, there was a small village called Angwan Fada. Um, where a lot of people from who were living in Pulka actually came from, but since it was outside the, the secure zone, they couldn't, they couldn't return home. So the idea was to propose that the, the security perimeter would extend outside of this village, so it would free up more space next to Camp D, and also um, have some potential of returns to the village. Um, we were all set and we were, about, we were almost close to, to, to having this uh, a fixed plan when unfortunately there were changes in the military officials and then the following January a new commanding officer came along and did not approve this change. Um, so we had to go back to the, to the drawing board and try and identify more land within the town. Um, so now jumping to uh, June 2020, um, We've seen now, again, looking for smaller parcels. So you can see them in, in green and in yellow. So the ones in yellow are ones that were not approved by the military. The ones in green 
are pieces of land that were approved by the military but are currently still pending approval i think by um uh, by the landowners um but again it's just continuous land assessments that were conducted in 2019 and then again in 2020 and there's just continuous push um to to find new solutions um for people who are still living in the reception center and um, just quickly in the last slide just um uh, the lessons that we learned, the three main lessons, that even though there were numerous challenges to, to the land of Bokasi, we had still managed to secure um, approximately 700,000 square, square meters of land um, over many months and very slow and painful process, but, but slowly but surely we managed to, to at least improve the situation as a way. Um, maintaining site planning standards was also very important because we've seen that there haven't been any major fire outbreaks um, reported within a planned camp, um, particularly when you compare this to the number of fires that are, um, occur in the spontaneous sites. Um, you see in these photos um, the, the extensions that the families have done, the cooking areas and shading, um, they make the spaces their own. Um, and also having a flexible approach in finding solutions. Um, the reception facilities and, and the emergency shelters that were constructed is very important um, in, this, in the evolving situation. I will now hand over to Maji, who will present to us um, our efforts on community engagement in the town of Ran. Maji, over to you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Hello, everyone. This is um, Maji, and I'm here can you hear me if I go? yes yep. very clear. okay all right that's nice so i'm here to share with us um some of the key community engagement activities we have done in run uh, um in trying to decongest um some of the congested um site in that particular location um um uh, before we go to the um, challenges um in that particular location i would like to put us through um, 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 some of um, basic information um, um, pertaining RAN. So um, RAN is situated, situated in um, international borders between Cameroon and Nigeria, and um, Kalibalge is the local government area where RAN is the headquarters of, uh, of the local government. Um, the first displacement occurred in April 2014 after attacks by Boko Haram or non-state armed groups. Uh, mainly in um, Taluta, Daima, Abor, and Jarwa villages, where most of the inhabitants fled to Meduguri. In March 2016, uh, uh, the military captured Ran, and um, IDPs um, started returning back in April 2016. Um, due to poor road condition, um, this prevented uh, most of the IDPs to come back uh, in big numbers. So, um, just to go through, uh, um, the contextual challenges we have here displayed uh, on our screen. Um, one is that um, security challenges. Um, RAN has suffered frequent attacks by non-state armed groups. So RAN is situated, situated in a very remote location where um, um, road accessibility is very um, 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 difficult. And also um, when it comes to um, security personnel um, that are there to protect IDPs or civilians um, are finding it difficult to do that um, considering the minimal number um, they are in that particular location. So security has been a major challenge in RAN and um, also logistic challenges. Um, humanitarian partners have been finding it very difficult to transport materials and also to transport aid um, due to the um, um, road ba uh, uh, bad road condition uh, of RAN. And um, when it rains, most of the time, RAN is cut off from Meduguri. Um, RAN is cut off for like um, seven to eight months where aid services or aid um, delivery is um, um, becoming very difficult w w when it rains in RAN. Um, another key challenge um, of RAN location is um, the climatic challenge where during Hamatan, the temperatures um, is very high. Uh, we have um, we, we don't have much um, vegetation in Ran, so this means that um, when it rains, it's very hot in Ran. And also, one of other another challenge um, is that um, Ran has many makeshift shelters built built by the IDPs. So we have more makeshift shelters, which is make make it which makes it very 
um, um, challenging when it comes to like planning and also it exposes it exposes um, the location to frequent fire outbreaks. So um, camp management has actively engaged um, 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 the community through several um, processes or mechanisms to reduce the risk of um, um, outbreaks. Um, for instance, uh, um, camp management has tried as much as possible to um, reorganize um, some of the um, uh, makeshift shelters um, um, to provide um, fire breaks and also waterways and also for, um, sanitation facilities. Next slide, please. So um, among the key community engagement um, camp management has conducted in run in order to achieve um, decongestion or uh, um, site reorganization is um, um, number one, discussing with military commanding officers for um, the given, uh, given go ahead to use um, um, or extend um, the camp in order to move some of the um, shelters that are in particular, that are very congested to uh, a more spacious place. So the military has been acting as the camp administration um, in that particular location. And um, that's why um, um, we usually engage the military for all this type of um, discussion. And another key um, community engagement process um, we have done is that um, uh, since inception, when camp management um, 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 went to run, we were able to map out all community leaders. And um, this has helped a lot in order to reach out to the community and also to start anything that can um, um, be of benefit of the ID, IDPs. The third uh, um, um, process we have conducted is that um, we are able to conduct um, focus group discussions. And this focus group discussion is um, aimed at um, getting feedback from the community or understanding the community, how they like arrange or how they, yeah, how, how they stay. And one, 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 one thing that is very outstanding in RAN is that uh, most of the community uh, members, they tend to uh, stay or live in families. So um, during this focus, this group, uh, focus group discussion, we are able to um, have an, a, a bit knowledge on how we can um, decongest the site further. Uh, the fourth step is that um, we went to the um, 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 camps and um, we've identified the hotspot of congestion and also identified which shelter needs to be moved out. So we were able to map out all these shelters that are um, in, in like that that are in in constructed in roads and shelters that um, are constructed in like drainage pathways and also shelters that are probably are, are, are exposed or they are very conditions that fire breaks can be very uh, fire breaks can happen like um, at any point in time so we are able to map out all these shelters and um, we have identified them. The fifth step is um, we were able to engage um, the military also to identify a space that can be used for relocation purposes. So um, the military um, have, has assisted us in identifying um, a space where um, it's a flood free zone and also um, is very suitable um, to construct shelters. So camp management was able to identify the, um, this space and also before even um, starting to um, have or demarcate spaces for shelter construction um, after the identification with the military and other key stakeholders we were able to take um, the key community leaders to a go and see visit of the particular space that can be used for the shelter construction uh, in the reorganization reorganization processes so during the papers um, during the process that's the sixth step um, families were sensitized and also families were made to understand the relocation date and where they will be relocated to and all of this basic information uh, so uh, 
families that we identified in the process were in form of the on the relocation date and so we were able to take them and also provide a space where they can uh, provide or construct shelters for themselves next slide please yeah sorry <laughs> so um just to summarize uh um everything uh just to inform you um, 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 my, our audience here that um, community engagement has really assisted camp management when it comes to reorganization of the of the um, uh, of the camp in uh, in run. So the takeaway point here is um, uh, mapping of community structures, identifying space that can accommodate households. Go and see visit with the community leaders and um, fiscal demarcation of, of of the spaces that um, the families can use for the um, relocation purposes. And also um, uh, the frequent meeting, like we have been engaging the, the military, we have been engaging the leaders and also some of um, groups, community groups in the, in, the, in the camp to inform them of all um, these processes so that they will be aware and also if they have any feedback and of which they have provided so many feedback that has really assisted us in um, the whole process of um, reorganizing and also decongesting the camp. Thank you so much. So we can hand over to uh, Gideon. So now Gideon will uh, present to to us the efforts on site improvements that were done in Teachers Village um, within my degree. Thank you very much, um, Jessica. Um, hello, everyone. This is um, Gideon Gada from IMCCM Northeast Nigeria. I'm here to briefly discuss on how site improvement was used to overcome congestion uh, using Teachers Village Camp as a case study. Next slide, please. So, um, in January 2019, there was a major influx of IDPs in Medigri following a non-state armed groups attacks in Baga town. Approximately about 5,000 households were displaced and majority of these people uh, went into teacher's village camp here in Medjugorje. So at that time, teacher's village camp was already considered to be highly congested with uh, very poor services and uh, site infrastructure was so insufficient. And this resulted in of a congesting of the buildings, people sleeping outside uh, with poor sanitary condition, and um, the camp was such a mess. Uh, in an effort to resolve all, resolve all these problems, a new site was set up. Uh, that was uh, that is new stadium camp, which um, accommodated about or which is accommodating about two thousand two hundred households which is not, still not sufficient to accommodate all the people that were displaced from Baga town. And more solutions were needed uh, for, for us or for the humanitarian community to solve the problem in teachers village camp, which uh, is the overcrowding and the poor sanitary conditions that we have in teachers village camp. Next slide. So this is an aerial uh, a satellite image of um, teachers village camp showing before the influx of the IDPs into Teachers Village Camp. You can see uh, there are no uh, shelters or let's say um, temporary shelters in between these block buildings. The block buildings are there without any temporary shelters. There are no makeshift shelters in between the block buildings, just the block building standing. And um, after the influx, you will see that um, the whole situation in the camp changed. So this is after the influx. You will see that um, now the site is overcrowded with makeshift shelters all over the place. You can also see that now we have some constructed shelters, temporary constructed, constructed shelters in between the block buildings where everywhere is overcrowded. Uh, people were literally living around latrines with very poor um, sanitary conditions. Next slide, please. So what was done to um, resolve the situation? 
in teachers' village camp. So multiple approaches had been taken to address the needs. Uh, many areas of the camps were not usable due to the frequent flooding. And um, we resulted to doing some site improvements in the camp so as to make this um, space is usable. So we undertook some backfillings of some lying, low lying areas. Uh, we went about uh, putting down drainages in, in order to take out um, water from areas where we intend to use. Also, we deployed water pumps where we can pump out water or stagnant water from some areas. So this has helped in making some of the land usable where we can construct more shelters and have people live there in order to just reorganize the site and reduce the congestion on sites. Next thing we did is um, the existing infrastructure, such as the shelters, the community spaces were all mapped out to enable partners to identify potential areas for construction. That is to say, in all the sites, we were able to point out where we can do the construction so as to still keep the standards, not uh, to allow partners go about um, constructing or putting down infrastructure everywhere on site. So the mapping out of infrastructure went a, a long way, or it was quite helpful in identifying spaces where we can carry out constructions. So plans were then presented to the community leaders for their feedbacks and approval. But uh, we encountered some challenges with the community, whereas they said some of the spaces cannot be altered because um, they use it as either a worship area or some spaces were used by the youth to play football and all that. So they said, we can only use some of the places, spaces, but um, they point out the areas or the spaces that we cannot use. So we had to just um, manage with what we have and um, what the community pointed out to us. So at the end of the day, it was seen that um, constructing partitioned um, communal shelters were preferred to make best use of the available spaces where we have long communal um, um, shelters where, which can house more households rather than have individual shelters where we, which will take a minimal number of households. So these um, communal shelters went a long way in giving shelters to, to many households that were displaced during that period. Next slide, please. So this is after the influx. You can see the green dots in the map, same map. This was after the reorganization of the site and um, after we were able to map out the spaces and uh, put down um, structures in order to decongest the site. And um, the green shelters in between the block spaces are where we were able to put uh, or construct shelters that gives a uh, household more houses or more shelters to, to live in. So this is um, so far the site improvement effort that was made in Teachers Village Camp that um, helped in decongesting the site in order to provide um, shelters to people that were displaced um, during the, the crisis from Baga Town. So I'll hand over now to um, Alberto. That's all from my end. Thank you. Thank you, Gideon. Um, I know that we're short on time, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, what I wanted to show uh, everyone today was a different example of what can be done um, in a congested area where no land is available. So this is an example from Onguno. We piloted this approach uh, of shelter replacement and camp reorganization at a very small scale, but other partners are also doing this and we plan to maybe scale up in the future. The idea is basically to look at um, uh, an, a camp that is congested and has mainly makeshift shelters, like this example is Nguno camp in Munguno. Um, and uh, basically most of the structures are built by the IDPs themselves, are encroaching on paths um, and sometimes built very close to the trees or waterlogged areas. Um, uh, some families are also building, uh, living in the existing buildings. So you can see in the plan, this is the before situation. Next slide. Um, the idea behind this approach is to basically replace the makeshift shelters with, with emergency shelters um, in these two zones of the camps. Uh, the, the idea was, the choice was to target these two zones because they're public land. So we would reduce possible issues um, arising from land ownership disputes. 
uh, that we know are very much of a challenge in Monguna and elsewhere. Um, and um, I'm just going to basically talk you through the process next. Um, basically, the process goes uh, starts from a site assessment and the community consultation, of course, to make sure that everybody's uh, aware and on board of uh, the idea. Um, then a mapping of the facilities and the main access roads uh, that will need to be inc incorporated in the new reorganized plan. Um, we also looked at identifying a transit accommodation uh, that could host families during the replacement process, imagining that if it takes more than one day, uh, then families would be without a shelter during the dismantling and construction. However, this actually didn't uh, turn out to be the case, so we didn't actually need it, um, but it was there as a contingency. Uh, then registration of families and uh, definition of shelter allocation criteria together with CCCM and with the camp leaders. Um, and then the actual shelter replacement process in batches. Uh, the, the idea of doing it in small uh, batches of 10 to 20 shelters was, def was defined based on the capacity of, of the workforce, both for the dismantling process uh, and the, con the, the construction of the new shelters so that it, can, it could be completed in, in one day. Next. Um, so here are more the steps of the actual replacement. So first of all, the, we engaged community carpenters uh, to dismantle the old shelters. Um, secondly, the, fam the families and some of the families mem family members actually helped in the process and they also removed all their belongings and put them on the side. Uh, next. Um, then the setting out and construction of the new shelters following the new reorganized plan um, was done again in batches. Uh, this was done through a contractor that we had already engaged for shelter construction previously. Um, and finally, at the end of the day, the House of Wood would move back to their new shelters and actually would start straight away improving the shelters, partly with the materials that they already had from their uh, shelters, um, salvaged from the previous shelters. Next. So um, here, I think something that I'd like to, to highlight in terms of pros or advantages of this approach is that we involve the community throughout um, and uh, the people uh, were actually involved in the process with the dismantling uh, and then actually upgrading their, their shelters, their new shelters. And the process was relatively fast, so I think it is something to raise. Um, it took um, around 20 days to complete uh, 260 shelter replacements and this includes also the dismantling uh, process. Um, we focus on creation of fire bricks, so that was one of the big um, goals, but also creating evacuation routes and clear paths throughout the shelter areas, and also creating some space for additional facilities, especially latrines, um, so that there would also be a safe distance from the shelters. Um, something that I didn't mention, but it was also relevant, was additional site improvements, um, such as backfilling of some areas that were lower, or reclaiming some of the waterlogged areas through embankments uh, that helped us use maximize the user space. Next. Maybe last but not least, some of the challenges. I mean, we were aware that uh, this type of approach can raise tensions, and this is um, why we actually chose to target the whole of the population in the two areas that we chose to intervene with this pilot. Um, also, there were some delays uh, due to lack of materials that were then addressed, so maybe they slowed down the process a bit, um, and this can happen. Um, some unexpected obstacles that were not uh, identified in the uh, mapping phase that uh, had uh, made that the plan had to be adjusted, but in, in, in the end, we managed to actually complete the shelters that we were targeting. Um, and then I think one of the risks that I think is really relevant and involves uh, camp management is the risk of the residents going back to the, what was before, so paths being blocked um, and um, some of the access routes not being accessible anymore. And this has to do with sensitization and follow up from camp management. This has been already explained and discussed very clearly with the community earlier on. So that's it from my side. I'm handing over to Robert for his presentation. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon. My name is Robert Odiombo, CCCM Shelter and FI Sector Coordinator. Um, when we run through another approach towards tackling the congestion, um, this, I hope you can hear me well. Can we confirm? 
Yes, Robert. Great. Yeah, so uh, what, what uh, this approach was derived from a rather um, larger scale uh, assistance in a particular area, look, looking at the congestion levels at, uh, at uh, some of the garrison towns. I'm going to be very brief about it. I think I just have like four slides. Uh, what you have in front of you is the map of Dikwa, uh, the garrison town. You can see the trench that, that forms the boundary around it. Um, the first thing I'd say is we had to extend the piece of land, um, uh, extend the trench, thereby opening up uh, new pieces of land, a new piece of land. At the time of the assessment, uh, we had about 25%, not in general, there were about 25% of the camps um, in the whole area, in the whole northeast that are over congested. Um, in Dikwa as well, um, about half of the half of that six of the twelve camps are considered congested. Um, so what, we, uh, what you can see in front of you, we were able to reveal uh, new land, and now I look towards providing a better settlement because com uh, complexing the whole situation is in a ten-year response. People are still living in emergency shelters. They're beginning to have a conversation of a more durable uh, transition or early, early recovery sort of response. Next slide, please. Um, so, I mean, these are just elevations of what we're intending to do. This rollout is beginning, um, has begun in this month. We're going to start it over with, uh, start it off with um, a full day workshop in Dikwa. The main approach in this decongestion um, strategy is a community-driven approach. So um, we are willing, we are planning to engage all the stakeholders in DECO, including host community, government, etc., um, uh, to be able to plan this out. Um, in retrospect, uh, for us to able to be able to get the land, there was a higher level advocacy um, uh, at all the way to the federal level. Um, with the humanitarian coordinator, the deputy humanitarian coordinator here, uh, with the governor um, and the military as well. And they saw the need to not only decongest but provide better living uh, conditions for the IDPs. So the, um, the area that was identified uh, can cater for up to 40,000 people. But in DEQA, we intend to, um, we intend to accommodate about 16,000. So there's still space uh, uh, for more um, uh, settlements to be put up, but uh, we can use that for farming uh, for now until other solutions are made. So the approach, um, uh, due to funding resources, we're not able to go directly into the, the transition of shelters, but um, uh, the Shelter Technical Working Group here in Maiduguri uh, came up with a brilliant idea that can be able to trans transform an emergency shelter to a transitional shelter, basically moving from, from uh, plastic sheeting to a uh, mud brick an iron sheet uh, roof house. Uh, we aim to do this, uh, as I said, um, also shift from uh, communal latrines to individual latrines. We're working, it's a multi-sectoral approach towards this decongestion strategy. Next slide, please. Oh, that was it. It was two slides. <laughs> That's it. And right on time, because they are about to shut the, the room <laughs> at four o'clock. Um, uh, so if I am really sorry that we don't have much time to to have a good discussion I was thinking that we can share the emails in the chat of the presenters and if there are any specific questions or further discussions that want to be had um, uh, you can get in touch directly thank you okay. yeah thank you all very much now, thanks very much for joining and for the participation with the questions um, I hope we managed to answer most of them. Uh, and if not, um, we're sharing our contacts so you can get in touch. I hope you enjoyed the session. Thank you, Team Nigeria. It was very good, even if I joined a little late. But the um, last part was very good. <laughs> Thanks and, for the hard work. And thank you to the big contingency from the Maiduguri office who have joined <laughs> this call. <laughs> Hello, what's <Wilson. laughs> Hi, Jessica. Longest time. Long, long time. Oh, yeah. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Sarah. Happy birthday. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. We all